Welcome to Programming Problems, where today we will wrap up the 12th day of Advent of Code 2023. We're almost at the halfway point. Let's start tackling hot springs. As we get higher and higher up during our journey, we need to travel via the hot springs to get to the next level. We might be able to use some of the bouncy springs, but not every spring works. To figure out which spring can be used, we receive condition records indicating which springs are damaged. Operational springs are indicated with a dot, while broken springs are indicated with a hash. For some springs, their state is unknown, as shown with a question mark. On top of that, we know that there are contiguous groups of broken springs, indicated by, for instance, 113. This means that there is one broken spring, then another broken spring, and then a group of three broken springs. Per record, we can determine the total number of arrangements of operational and broken springs that meet the given criteria. The key question for part one then becomes, what is the sum of all the possible arrangements across all records? For starters, here is a complete example with no unknowns. This means that it is a single possible arrangement. This arrangement shows one broken spring on the left, one broken spring in the center, and a group of three broken springs on the right, most edge. Note here that groups must be separated by one or more dots. Here is a very similar example, where we simply have multiple dots in between the groups. Here is the first example again, but with three unknowns at the start. Still, we need to place the three groups of broken springs. Do you see why only one arrangement works? In this example, we need to place groups of size 1, 6, and 5. Note that we must maintain order. The groups of 6 and 5 are already on fixed locations. All that is left is to determine where the group of one spring can go. For this, the following four positions are possible, meaning that this record has four possible arrangements. Lastly, here is an example with 10 different possible arrangements. Please pause the video to convince yourself that this is indeed the correct number and that you understand why these arrangements are possible. To solve this problem on your own, now is a good moment to go get your own puzzle input from adventofcode.com. Let's continue to the solution. For part one, let's do a brute force strategy to check all possible arrangements. The high-level solution outline then looks as follows. We initialize our total to zero, and then we loop over all the lines of data in the input. Per line, we extract the record and the groups that need to be placed, and then we wrap the record with two additional dots. The details of why is something we'll look into later. Then finally, we'll do a recurse depth first search on the record and groups to compute the possible arrangements, which we will add to the total. Parsing the data is fairly simple. Note that instead of us storing the groups as a list of integers, we store them as a tuple. Both are valid solutions for part one. Then, the meat and potatoes of today's part one. We do the brute force recursively, meaning that we keep solving smaller and smaller subproblems until a problem is so small that the answer is trivial. The subproblem that I've chosen to solve is to see if given a record and a set of groups, it is possible to place the first group such that its last element is at position I. The graph shows it visually. First, we get the record of three question marks and groups one, one, and three. Then, for every position, we can check if we can make the first group end at the index. Since there are seven characters in the record, we have seven possible steps to check. In each of them, I indicate where I'm putting the hash with the black hash sign. Here we see which of these subproblems actually has a valid solution. Only the green states are states which we can try to solve recursively, meaning that we call the exact same function, but with a substring of the original record and a subset of the original groups. The algorithm looks as follows. It takes in the state, which is the record as a string and the tuple of groups, and it returns the integer number of possible arrangements for any given subproblem. Then, as is typical with these types of algorithms, we first have the trivial check to see if we are in an end state. In cases where we have no groups to check, 
Then we must see if there are still hash signs left in the record. If there are, then the state which we check cannot be a solution, because all hash signs must map to some group. Assuming we are not in a trivial case, then we have to place another group in the record. The size of this group is the first element of the groups tuple. We can update groups to have it removed for the next recursion. Then we start with checking all possible next states, as shown on the right. The count is zero, and we check for every possible end position in the record. Firstly, we need to determine the start of the segment or group, then we can see if a segment fits in the record. We do this using the fits function. If it fits, then we add to our count the number of arrangements determined by solving the subproblem. To solve the subproblem, we recurse using a substring and the updated group's tuple. Key to this algorithm is to see if a group or segment fits in the record. This function looks as follows and has a few cases to check. Let's tackle them individually. Firstly, given the blue record, we need to check if a segment is within the bounds of the record. So we check the start and end positions. Secondly, we need to check if the segment can be surrounded by non-hash characters. This is a requirement as every group must be surrounded by dots. Question marks can, of course, become dots. Thirdly, we must check if placing a group at the current location does not cause us to skip hashes. Doing so would lead to an invalid solution, as every hash needs to be part of a group. Lastly, if all other cases were okay, then we need to see if there are no dots on any of the spots where we try to place the group. The second check of our FITS algorithm is the reason why we surround the record with dots. This removes any possible edge cases where we try to put the group on the edge of the record. In those cases, the edge would not have a dot as spacer for the group, meaning the check needs to become more complex. With dots at the edges, we're always golden. And that was part one. Let's recurse into part two. In typical advent of code fashion, there's more to our input. There are many more springs than we see in our record list. Turns out that the records themselves were folded. To unfold the records, first we replace each list of spring conditions with five copies of itself, separated by question marks. Then secondly, we replace each list of groups with five copies of itself, separated by commas. After the unfolding, what is the sum of the arrangements across all records? Since this problem is just a bigger version of part one, let's move straight into the solution. The solution outline is the same, but of course, we need to unfold the data. So in parse data, we now multiple the record and groups by five, taking into consideration the symbols with which we should join them where necessary. The next step is to see how we deal with this large input. It is simply too large for naively brute forcing with our previous algorithm. However, many of the subproblems overlap, so we can reuse results. Please try to understand this diagram if you're unfamiliar with the concept of overlapping subproblems. The key idea is that if we start on the left-hand side with many question marks and three groups to place, then there are three intermediate problems where we have a hash on position five. Now, all three of these intermediate problems will be trying to recurse on the same subproblem. The subproblem is basically, given a sequence of question marks, place one additional hash. As you can see, there are three arrangements possible. However, we don't want to recurse through the entire list of subproblems over and over again. If we have already seen a subproblem, then we can just store the result of the recursion and reuse the result later when we encounter it again. This saves huge amounts of time. This technique is called memoization. It is trivially achievable if you make the arguments of your function hashable. Strings are hashable, and tuples as well. Lists are not, because they are mutable, which is why I opted for tuples already in part one. Now, if your arguments are hashable, then you can just apply the cache decorator from Funk Tools, and that's it. You will solve part two in a very reasonable amount of time. For those of you who are not using Python, fret not. Here's how you can do it without relying on a library. 
You just need to make sure that your state can be used as a key in some dictionary or map, and then when you enter the recursive function, you check. Is this state already in the map? If so, then return the answer stored in the map. If not, continue with the function. Then at the end of the function, just before returning, make sure that you store the answer in the memo. And that's it once more. Two more stars. Thank you for helping me pass the 200 subscriber mark. I'm happy to see so many enjoy these videos. And for now, I'll start putting effort towards finishing the next one.